what's up everyone and this is kind of an interesting episode and uh i thought it might be uh, i don't know bring up confrontation or argument so honestly i decided to try to turn this into a more positive episode i discussed it with the community and i asked them what they thought about the concept of me talking about how pre-supports just sometimes don't work uh all the time most of the time don't work and it's not really the fault of the guys who make them uh, and i am one of them so it, it takes a lot of energy and effort to make pre-supported files my my files don't work 100 percent of the time and that's why we have things called corrected or repaired versions of a supported file in most cases the issues that we come across are technical though and this is why i kind of wanted to cover over this in more of a technical nature rather than just go look at this this isn't supported properly First of all, one of the biggest issues that we find is when you get a file that's been pre-supported, it's usually done at one layer height. Usually it's covered at 50 UM or um, 50 microns, and that's, kind of, that's pretty much the standard height that most people print in resin when it comes to pre-supporting. In the case of when you're taking that and then lowering the layer height down to, say, 20, 35, 40, 45, whatever, be any difference in layer height from where it was supported at unless they're diligently going into those layer heights and adjusting back and forth you're going to find new islands that they did not find you are going to find parts of the model that did not get supported the way that it needs to be to make sure that it flawlessly prints with no pancaking or any weird issues like that and I'm not saying that the file isn't supported properly for a 50 micron print I have actually tried to print some of these with their pre-supports and most of them did not work or parts of them did not work with the exception I think of one. Um, I, I actually have whole build plates of stuff like this that are from the same exact guys and I love these guys models they're great that all completely fail all at once and again you know people could say oh it's your resin it's environmental things well that's funny because whenever I support stuff it works just fine. Now, I'm going to roll this down to the fact that most of these things are generically supported for a particular style of printer, a particular brand or type of resin, or maybe they're just done in such a way that this is just how they were instructed to do it because this is how they have to pump out the support designs because of how many different um, 3D models they literally work with on a daily basis. I personally do not because I'm a much smaller individual company. I pretty much work by myself doing this stuff. So I don't have a whole team of guys that I can back up to and say, okay, I need all these files supported by tomorrow. No, if I have 35 files, I need to do each one by hand. And uh, the rate that I take them, I, it does take me some time to do it. And so unfortunately, you know, I do pass on bigger volume jobs because I, I can't take them on. Um, I just don't have the manpower or the time. But these guys, I think, take on a lot more work. And so I think what happens is, is you wind up getting a more generic approach to each model. And if you look... There's not, it's not huge issues. There are things that you can fix with, um, like I said, you want to, if you want to adjust your layer height, please make sure you search for islands again. You're going to find some. Um, if you change anything, if you realign the model at all, please, my goodness, readjust the supports. That is not going to help your case. Um, if you go slice by slice, like I do, and you see big areas of the model that are open or left kind of loosely supported like i like to call it where you you would look at this and go yeah this is going to make it but what i'm going to wind up with is i'm going to wind up with some sag bumps um pretty heavy in between these supports where there's those big um millimeter two millimeter gaps in between those supports because there's a lot of space there um, there's even a wider gap in, the, in in that upper area there and so i think a lot of that will make a big difference if you go in and you kind of finitely tune your supports and I, I discussed this with a few people on discord and, and some other um, channels that I communicate on and we all pretty much agreed that you know it's, it's more of a varying thing you don't necessarily take a pre-supported file and go yay it works I'm just gonna print it um, you always have to kind of analyze it and look at it for your environment you have to kind of look okay well how do I normally print stuff my supports are this um, I use this for lights mediums and blah um, I know for example that when I print something this size this is how I would do it so when you look at it and you go, this doesn't look anything like that, or this just looks far too, you know, like minimal. Um, in my opinion, sometimes that's what it turns out to be. It's more minimalistic. And so, yeah, I, I tend to uh, extend upon what is already done. I don't replace it in most cases. When it comes to miniatures and stuff like that, I will actually take the pre-supported files if they're there, and I will kind of look at them 
I'll delete some of the supports that are either in, in a place I don't like or whatever. And then I'll just add ones in places that I think that they should be um, some additional supporting going on. Now, again, this is just my opinion. Hey, you know what? Everybody does their work their own way. Uh, in this particular instance, I like to go in and kind of modify them. So really in this episode, my stress here is just, this is not me bashing anybody. The work that they do here is very taxing. It's, <laughs> I mean, working on these models like this all day with these, you know, supports. And you guys do this yourself, so you know this is, it's boring sometimes. No one wants to do that. Uh, the hammer object here that we're coming up on, this was actually one of the ones that actually printed just fine on its own. Uh, except for that underside right there, got a little pancakey, and I lost a little tiny bit of detail on the corner. Um, on both corners, actually, that entire edge kind of went flub. Uh, but the whole thing did actually print, and so that was a success. It did not pull off the build plate or anything. I am just going to add a bunch of mini supports in there as a simple fix to give that a little bit more strength when it prints off because I think all it was, it was just too much extra material coming off at that high angle and there was no supporting underneath it really. So I mean, that's a whole yellow zone. I, 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 my, my brain doesn't like that. Nope. <laughs> I have to, to re-support it. And again, like I said, I did attempt printing a, a bunch of these standard um, pre-support files ages ago when I was getting into the 3D printing stuff early on and these were some of my practice files and I love these these files they're great I have since printed most of them successfully um, either at the scale that they were meant to or bigger and I, I love them for that reason because they're infinitely scalable they're great they're great models um, so I do appreciate that the bottom of the hammer is actually supported perfectly I would not have done that any differently myself it has two supports on that edge right there and it comes up nice and perfect. It has a lot of contact support going on and it's good. And that's again, probably one of the reasons why it succeeded because your first couple layers are really the most important. Um, the edge island here, uh, I do not believe we will catch an island on this. Um, they actually did very well with this. Even at the 20 micron uh, difference, th this actually does not catch it. It has one little tiny cubit thing which I don't know if I'm going to consider an island because if you look at it from the top which is the pixel and, and people will argue well that's what gets illuminated yes however there's that bleed zone that happens on every single flash and this is why light off delays are important and you see underneath the bit of the model touches but see I don't trust this either <laughs> there's a lot of guys I've talked to that don't trust this a lot and you look at it you go hmm this side looks like this, and this side looks like that. Well, which side do you trust? Honestly, neither. So what I'll do is I'm just going to run a support from this, the bit that it'll let me touch to you know the nearest support underneath it. And even though that looks ridiculous because you're practically supporting nothing that's already connected, you will thank yourself later when that bit of the model does not pancake squish. Now, on the print that I have, I didn't actually pay attention to see if that had any issues with it. I actually should go back and look at that. Um, but that, again, could potentially be a problem. And the, the size of support we're using is so minimalistic, it's not going to do you much damage. I'm also going to add a couple extra supports there at the back of the hammer, just to give it a little extra oof as it uh, finishes. It's, it's a small, but technically, since it's a big block, it's actually got a decent amount of weight to it. It's also pretty hefty, so I'm not worried about breaking it. Uh, now the dwarf himself is interesting. He actually wasn't so bad as far as islands and stuff like that when I went over him at the different layer heights, um, which I always like to compare when I run the print, uh, before I run prints. Um, but some of the yellow zones I wanted to cover up. He has a couple stress areas, especially on these lighter parts that definitely risk pancaking. Um, now when I tried to print this one, he did not actually print for me. Um, he came off the build plate around half, and I don't know if that's because he was just under-supported at the bottom or what the issue was with him, but um, I will actually have to try and redo this one entirely. Um, I actually haven't tried to reprint this guy. <laughs> I still have the hammer. <laughs> Sorry, dwarf. <laughs> you, you, haven't been, you haven't been made successfully yet. Um, now again, there's some things I have learned a lot since I started printing this guy in particular because he was one of the uh, I think one of the first ones I messed with really um, and some of these other ones I'm showing you too. Uh, 
and uh, yeah this you know there's some things that i figured out since then so uh, this particular one is a nice example i think of uh some of my um early uh test runs we'll call them now this dwarf model is pretty cool i do actually want to print a, a bigger scale version of him so i think i'm going to save my effort and scale him up and i'll just call the hammer a um a successful print we'll say the hammer worked except for the little pancakey we'll 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 call it a partial success uh, again you know it, it's all about modifying the way it's supported if you don't like the way that it comes pre-supported then take the supports off and redo it yourself uh, there's always that option now the bottom of the feet and now that I'm looking at it I think I realized why he might have ripped in half I think part of the middle section needs a little more supporting along some of those um, bits that hang out I don't see why that would cause him to rip in half but I don't know there's uh there was really no other reason for it he was literally about halfway done printing and he just decided to tear himself off the build plate and stick to the FEP at that point <laughs> luckily no damage to the printer was done I was uh get angry when that happens I hate having to replace that um, so yeah I also am gonna add some supports under the chin and I'm gonna try to make these minimal I'll use uh, some tree type supports and connect some branches there to try to make this um, not heavy with supporting because um, you obviously want to try and keep it still as minimal as possible with a mini i mean you don't need to it doesn't need to be uh fenced in completely uh we're talking 32 millimeter miniatures i think at this scale so yeah he, he doesn't need to be mega supported uh, but they do i do focus on the yellow zones anything that seems to have been missed or maybe there's just a little too much space for my liking i'm gonna go back and fill in the gaps um, and again, you know, go slice by slice. Do your checks. Um, see, like right there, again, this is that pixel thing going on. I guarantee it. Uh, and that's actually more than a pixel, technically. What is going on is that you're seeing what the light is going to do. But again, you have to remember, it's got that bleed, too. Anyway, we're going to move on to something that is actually excellently pre-supported in a moment that i had zero issues with at the time because i printed it at 50 microns and i didn't change layer heights and it seemed to have been set up perfectly for that um but there's not a lot of models on the market that i found that are like this now this is puck i got him for free and he's from a company called table flip foundries and these guys are great they've actually i've learned a lot from watching their videos thank you you guys are awesome um this file is perfectly pre-supported at 50 microns i found no islands it was fine um when i tuned it down to 20 i found like nine big whoop it's not really that big of a deal besides i don't print at 20 anyway i just do this to do my analysis to see how many extra islands i can find um, and this is actually something we've talked about is that there there is this i don't know i, I don't even call it a glitch uh there's this lychee slicer thing where essentially each layer will show you you know more islands and it makes perfect sense if you think about it on a pixel basis because it's just simply seeing more pixels purse uh you know for the different slices because it's technically making more slices this totally makes sense um now the reason for this me bringing this up again is because it's still something that you guys can use to fix a file if it's something you if you really want to be 100 percent sure that you're catching every single island this is definitely a good way of checking and doing it on a pre-supported file is okay too even if you know the file is going to work like I said, table flip, their stuff's flawless. I've never had an issue with any of their stuff. And this can still be a very viable way of checking for those additional islands that you may, you know, not see otherwise. Our eyes aren't perfect, and sometimes using the algorithm and stuff like that, and using the, you know, the software, it, it's good, you know. Um, I still know folks that will still do this and then go back to UV tools and do that as well. Um, 
I don't go that I don't go that far um, I do quite a lot but that's I do I do uh, eventually go okay I need to work on another file um, and again most of my pre-supports work that I do it's about 90 I was gonna say 97 percent good success right um, I will have a fail every now and then but that's usually on my time and my printer so um, once I get the file working 100 um, percent that's when the client gets it and of course I'll, I'll give them some guidelines too like you know particular types or qualities of resin are required for particular types of supporting uh, that's the other thing that I didn't talk about too much in this episode, and I probably should. Different types of resin quality will actually affect the way supports work. If you're using a very cheap resin, if you're using the most basic stuff you can, expect a lot of pre-support work to fail, because that resin is actually a lot cheaper to make, and it has a lot less um, tensile strength. So you're not going to get as much strength out of it, and neither are your supports. When you're working with higher quality resins, Craftsman's, ABS, um, 8K capable stuff, it's a lot stronger, the tensile strength is better, and you're gonna have a lot better success rates when it comes to pre-supporting files because, well, they just, they tend to support the way they do, and honestly, if your resin is just the standard stuff, you're probably gonna have a bad time with it. And yeah, that's unfortunately the truth to that, and I, I've experienced some of that myself early on. Anyway, that's pretty much it for this one, guys. I hope you guys walked away with something and learned a little bit more about how to handle some of your pre-supporting woes. I know most pre-support files can be really doozies to work with, and we're all kind of iffy every time we get a new one, like, is this going to work, or do I have to find somebody, you know, maybe to fix this, or should I just try to spend the couple of hours it's going to take to fix this myself? Yeah, in my case, I just usually take the file and start working on it myself, but... I know sometimes we don't want to sit there and support every single thing. And I get it. Sometimes we don't. You know, I don't, but hey, that's my job. <laughs> anyway, guys, I hope you liked this episode. We're going to do some more community voting and stuff like that. I also am planning an episode where we showcase the making of Lilith, the mother of Sanctuary. Um, we're also going to showcase some more stuff about the Neo Metal Sonic character that we've been working on, secret project there and a bunch of other stuff. So thanks so much for watching. See you all soon, guys.